Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you today. Psalms chapter 66, verses 1 through 3. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Let's stand together this morning and let's praise God for his awesome deeds. Good to see y'all this morning, and I agree with uh, I agree with Michael. It was really good to see our our choir and our orchestra back up here. Uh, this has been uh, such a good weekend. Last night we had a great worship service, choir and orchestra. Then and, and then just now, it's it's good to it, you forget how much you miss certain things, and, and that was a reminder of how much I've missed our choir and orchestra and the the sound they make, but also just seeing them up there praising God helps me worship. Uh, this next weekend we're going to restart life groups and we're really excited about that. So if, if you don't already know, uh, contact your life group leader and find out what time and place they're going to be meeting. You're going to be meeting because we want you to be a part of that. Uh, it, is, it is good to get back to some semblance of normality. Uh, it's a reminder too of the people that I miss. There's so many people who don't yet feel comfortable coming back and if you're one of those and you're watching me now, thank you for taking the time to do that. I just want you to know we miss you, and you come back when you feel safe doing so. But in the meantime, we love you and we miss you. And I just think, at moments like this, I just think how great heaven's going to be. You know, Revelation 5 talks about uh, John in the new earth sees this spectacular choir of every nation, race, and tongue praising God together. And I know that I'm in that choir by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus, and so are many of you, if not all of you and many people who've gone before us, and many people, millions of people we haven't met yet. And how amazing is that going to be? That incredible reunion, that incredible 
worship service. What we do here is just the appetizer to what that's going to be. And, and I look forward to it. Acts chapter 9 is where we are this morning as we start the study of the life of Paul. And the title of the series is How to Change the World. Because let's face it, which one of us wouldn't like to see the world change for the better? We all would. We all see ways it could be a better world. And we know that God is always at work redeeming this world. He's bringing peace, that word shalom in, in Hebrew that means the ordering of all things the way they should be, harmony, peace, unity, and tranquility and prosperity the way it was meant to be. God is always at work bringing this world back to that state, the state of shalom, the peace in the midst of chaos. Uh, we, we've been talking about that all year long, and God's always at work doing that. And you and I may say, okay, that's great, but I don't really want to change the world, Jeff. I'm, I just want to be happy. I, I, you know, I gave up all these idealistic dreams of, of being some kind of incredible hero or, or, or world changer when I was a kid. Uh, and I understand that, but you need to understand this. Happiness doesn't come when we seek happiness. I know it's ironic. I know it doesn't make any sense to say that. But the more you chase after happiness on your terms, the more it will elude you. And if you look back at your life, you can probably see that. The times when you were most focused on your own happiness were the times when you were least happy. I, I know I learned that in marriage. The more I focus on getting my wife to be who I want her to be, the less happy I'm going to be. The more I focus on being the person she needs me to be, the happier I am. It's ironic, isn't it? And yet that's the way it is in all of life. You see, God is always at work bringing peace to chaos, and he invites us. In fact, he commands us to be part of that process. Let me give you a few verses. This isn't what I'm preaching on. This is just the introduction. But 1 Corinthians 3.9 says, we are God's fellow workers. God says, come, you're my teammates. I'm going to put you on the front lines of my process of redemption, my mission of making this world the way it should be. And then he goes even further in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. You, meaning us, the church, the body of Christ, you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And I love that analogy. We hear you are the body of Christ and we, we think about, oh, well, you know, I'm an earlobe and you're an elbow and uh, he's obviously an armpit. Have you been around him? But what Paul's actually saying is something much more profound than that. Because, let's face it, anything you and I do, we do in our body. If you go out to eat, you go out to eat in your body. If you mow the yard, you do it in your body. If you go for a jog, if you sit down on the couch, if you go to bed at night, all of that you do in your body. You don't do it in your spirit. Your body is required for you to do anything. And what Jesus is saying through Paul in that verse is, anything I do in the world, I'm going to do through my body. And that is the church. So if you want to know, in times of crisis, in times of trauma, where is God? What is God up to? Ask yourself, where is the church? Where are God's people? What are they doing? That's what God is doing. That's our job. We're his body. And then we all know, right at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And in verse 14, you are the light of the world. So in the same way that a single light bulb can change the whole environment of a room, in the same way that just a few shakes from a salt shaker can change an entire casserole, you and I, as God's people, were created to make a difference in the world that is out of proportion to our size or our number or our perceived power. And, and I know lots of times we feel a sense of, of kind of wistfulness for the past when Christians had more influence on the direction of our culture. And, and I do too. But at the same time, you look back through history and realize the church is always at its best when it's a minority. The church is always at its best when it seems weak because that's when God's power shows. We are God's people. We're his salt. We're his light. We're his co-workers. We're his body. And that means, that means if you want to be happy, then you do it by accomplishing your purpose in this world. It's incredibly ironic, but if you, if you focus on simply being happy on your own terms, you'll never get there. But if instead you choose a life of loving God by serving others in his name, if you, if you choose to, to try to make the world a better place in his name by spreading the gospel, by living out your faith, you're going to find a happiness and a joy and a contentment you could never find in money or pleasure or fame. It's just true. So, be a world changer. 
get on board with what God is doing. Now, we're going to start today with the, the story of Saul's conversion. And we love conversion stories. I'm a subscriber to Christianity Today, and every month when the new issue comes in, the first thing I do is go to the very back page, because the back page is always the story of someone's testimony. And they're always really great stories. Growing up in a Baptist church like I did, I heard lots of good testimonies, not necessarily from the members of my church, but every year when we have revival services, it seemed like that revival preacher always had some great testimony he would share. Uh, growing up, you remember Billy Graham, test, Billy Graham Crusades would always be on TV every so often, and he'd always have some person get up and give this powerful testimony. Great testimonies would become best-selling books. They'd become movies. And then there's Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, greatest testimony of all time. I can remember when, when I was a kid and a teenager, there was a guy, an evangelist, who had, had this incredible testimony. He had been a high priest in the satanic church. And he, he had all these lurid tales of these awful things he'd done in service of the devil. And then God came into his life and changed him. And this guy sold millions of copies of his biography and lots of albums because he was also a singer and, and a comedian. And he was invited to speak at churches all across the country. And I remember one night, uh, I was watching Nightline, and they were talking about Satanism, and they had this guy on as an expert on the topic of devil worship. And then a, a Christian magazine came along and investigated him and found that he'd made most of it up. He'd never been a high priest in the church of Satan. It was all made up. And that just shows you and I, we, we read about Paul and we read about his testimony because I think probably everybody in this room and probably most of you watching online have heard this story. And we think, boy, my story doesn't match up. And we feel this need to embellish. Well, there's no need to embellish. Your story as it is, is a miracle. And I want to show you why. Your story has three things in common with the Apostle Paul's story. It, it has these three things in common. How Jesus changed my life, who he used to do it, and what he's been doing since then. Your story has those elements just like Paul's does. So let's go through Paul's story looking at it through that lens. First of all, how Jesus changed my life. How did Jesus change the life of the Apostle Paul? Paul was born Saul of Tarsus. Now here's a common misconception. People think that that he was known as Saul as a kid, and then he became Paul once he became a Christian. You'll hear people say, I went from Saul to Paul, right? That's not actually true. He, Saul was his Hebrew name. He started going by Paul when he went into Gentile territory spreading the gospel. You know why? Because the name Saul is a fine name in Hebrew, but in Latin it sounds like a word that means a man with a prissy walk. So I think you and I would have changed our names too. Saul was born in the city of Tarsus, which is in modern day Turkey. And he was a Jew of Jews, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. When he was a young man, he went to study in Jerusalem under the very famous scholar and rabbi Gamaliel. He learned well. He became a Pharisee, member of that body of, of people, uh, of Jewish men, whose whole, whose whole goal was to keep the people of God true to the word of God. And as such, Saul would have been the kind of guy who could have quoted you any section of the Scriptures, any section of the Torah from memory, and who lived it out. You could have followed Saul day and night and never seen him commit a sin, because all of his sins were internal. Saul uh, had this incredible zeal, whereas today there are young men and women who say, I want to be on the Olympic stand with a gold medal around my neck, or I want to reach the top of the class at Harvard or Yale, or, or I want to be the best brain surgeon on the Atlantic coast, or I want to be the, the top of the Fortune 500, Saul's goal was, I want to be the most zealous servant of God who's ever lived. I want the Lord to look down on me and my fellow Jews to look at me and say, no one loves Yahweh as much as Saul of Tarsus, and no one hates the enemies of God quite like this man from Tarsus. And of all the people in all the world, there was no one who stirred up Saul's righteous, he thought, anger as much as the followers of Jesus. The followers of Jesus were especially contemptuous to him because of the book of Deuteronomy, ironically. Because there had been lots of would-be messiahs down through the years, lots of different sects of Judaism, but Jesus was hung on a cross. And the book of Deuteronomy specifically said, cursed is anyone who is hung upon a tree. 
And that's a man-made tree in Paul's eyes. In Paul's eyes, it meant that was clear evidence that God had cursed Jesus of Nazareth. And how could the anointed one of God be someone that God had cursed? So anytime he heard someone say that Jesus is Christ or that Christ is risen, he said, you're committing blasphemy. You're contradicting the Bible. You are, you are calling God a liar. And so in his zeal, he sought to arrest every follower of Jesus he could find, throw them in jail, put them on trial, see them executed if necessary. Eventually, the church was scattered. This is how great this man's zeal was. The church of Jerusalem, thousands of people excited about following Jesus, abandoned Jerusalem to get away from this one man. That wasn't good enough for him, though. He asked the high priest for letters of introduction so he could go to any synagogue in the Mediterranean and say, I'm here to take that guy and that guy and that guy back to Jerusalem for trial and you have to let me because the high priest says so. And on his way to Damascus, six days journey from Jerusalem, here's what happened. Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I want you to imagine how Paul must have felt. Here he had devoted his life to doing what he thought would make him the most esteemed, admired follower of God on earth. He thought this would get him the first seat in heaven, only to find out he was fighting against God himself. He'd been, he'd been shouting down anyone who said Christ was risen. Now he has a conversation with that very man he thought was dead. Imagine thinking that you're the next Billy Graham only to find out that you're actually the next Osama bin Laden. That's what Paul found out. Blaise Pascal, the Christian philosopher, said it this way, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. Christians, we need to remember we can make the same mistake if we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, if we're not, if we're not in the Word of God. Our zeal for what we think is a righteous cause can drive people away from the gospel. So be careful. Imagine how Paul felt. And now think about this. Your story and my story, they're not nearly that dramatic. I, I got saved when I was nine years old. I, I was in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and most Wednesday nights from the time I was born. Heck, from the time I was in my mother's womb. So it was only natural when I was nine years old to say, I think I'm old enough to understand how to give my life to Jesus, and I'm going to do it now. I got baptized the same day. I called the preacher that afternoon and said, I can't wait. Can we fill the baptistry for tonight's service and get, and get baptized tonight? And he said, absolutely. When I was 16, I, I came before the Lord during a revival service and said, I know that I was saved when I was nine, but, but now that I'm 16, I understand really what it means to follow Jesus. And so I made a second commitment, a, a rededication of my faith. And that was the point at which I really started growing. Now, only God knows what was my real salvation experience. I'm not worried about that. But the, the point is, when I was nine and when I was 16, I hadn't killed anybody. I hadn't robbed any banks. I hadn't gotten strung out on drugs. I hadn't fathered any illegitimate children. I hadn't done any scandalous stuff. So it's not like my turn was something dramatic. And yet, Jesus changed my life through this process, through my parents, through good people at church, through the conviction of sin of the Holy Spirit, I realized I don't want to live my life on my own. I don't want to go my own way. If I do that, it will be uh, the worst mistake I could ever make. Life apart from Jesus is not worth living. How did that happen for you? Was it a one time, was it a one big moment like it was for Paul? Or was it a long process of disillusionment with your current life? How did it happen? How did God change your life? See, the thing is, in all other religions, the idea is you, you, you agree with a certain list of doctrines, you go through a certain ritual or, or series of rituals, and you agree to follow certain rules, and you're a member of that religion. That's how it works. But in Christianity, it's not like that at all. 
There are rules, there are rituals, there are doctrines, absolutely, and they all matter. But salvation in the Christian faith is a U-turn. And U-turns don't happen until you first hit the brakes. You've got to stop going one way to start going the other. So how did it happen that you stopped going down the road you were, you were on and decided to turn? Second part, part of your story in any story of the Lord, who God used to do it. Who did God use to help you know you needed to change your life? Who did God use to introduce you to Christ? Who did God use to help you grow in discipleship and become the person you're becoming now? See, here's an interesting misconception. A lot of people say that Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, and that's not actually true. See, Paul was convinced his life was ruined on the road to Damascus, but he wasn't saved yet. A saved person doesn't refuse to eat or drink anything for three days. That's a person who wants to die. Paul was, was blinded. And I'm sure sitting in that home on Straight Street in the city of Damascus, he thought to himself, this blindness is just the beginning. Because the judgment is coming and the judgment is going to be hard and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be awful and I deserve every single bit of it because I persecuted the church of my God. And he was waiting for that. He wasn't saved he was waiting for his judgment until a man came into that house named Ananias. Ananias is one of the great unsung heroes of the New Testament. We don't know much about him except that he was a believer in Jesus and he was there in the city of Damascus. Was he a longtime resident of Damascus or was he one of those people in Jerusalem that Paul had chased out? We don't know. Either way, I can almost guarantee you Ananias knew very personally some of the people that Paul had persecuted the Christian community wasn't that large at that time. He was, he was friends with, maybe even relatives with, some of the people who had been thrown in jail and even executed because of Paul's work. And yet when he walks into that room to lay hands on Paul, Saul of Tarsus, I want you to look at what he says in verse 17. Brother Saul. Think about that word brother. I'm sure in his heart of hearts he wanted to say, you murderous thug. You unworthy swine. You person deserving of eternal hellfire. But he didn't say any of that. He said, you're my brother, Saul. Jesus died for you just like he died for me. Now you're part of my family and you always will be. That's profound. Then he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight. Think about what that must have meant to Paul who thought at that point God is about to wipe me from the face of the earth. Maybe he's going to leave me to, to rot here for a while in my blindness. But sooner or later I'm going to hell. And now Ananias shows up and says, no, Jesus doesn't want to destroy you. He sent me to redeem you. This is the first time Saul ever became aware of the grace of God. Think about that. And he would never forget that lesson. For the rest of his life, he'd say, I'm the chief of all sinners, and yet look what God has done in my life. He says that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Ananias laid hands on Saul, something like scales fell from his eyes. The word that Luke used can, be, can refer to any kind of filmy substance like the scales of a fish. Some people think that Paul ha had developed cataracts because of his encounter on the road. We don't know exactly what it was that fell from Saul's eyes one way or another. It was just a physical representation of the fact that once he was blind, but now he can see. For the amazing grace of God saved a wretch like me. And that's when Paul was saved because the Holy Spirit entered into him at that moment. The Bible is very clear that when the Holy Spirit comes into you, that's when you are saved. And when you are saved, that's when you receive God's Holy Spirit. And it happened because of Ananias. And Ananias isn't the only one. Galatians 1.18 tells us that three years later, Paul went to Jerusalem to meet the apostles. Luke kind of compresses all of that. So in chapter 9, that's, that story is found in verse 26. He goes to Jerusalem, and of course the disciples don't want to talk to him. They're, they're avoiding him. They're giving him the cold shoulder because they all know you're the one who destroyed our church. You're the one who led to the execution of my friend, my cousin, my brother-in-law. And then along comes Barnabas, and Barnabas fills the gap. Anybody know what Barnabas' actual given name was? Anybody? 
It was Joseph. Joseph was his given name, which is a fine name. That's the name of Jesus' uh, Jesus' dad. But the church gave him the name Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement, which means he's the kind of guy who made everyone around him better. Couldn't we use some Barnabases in our world today? Barnabas came along, put his arm around Paul, and walked into the room and said, Hey, Peter, this is my friend Saul. Saul, here's James and John. Watch out for them. They're a little temperamental. Look, there's, there's uh, Thomas. He may doubt that he, he's actually met you, but he has. And, you know, all along the road he goes and introduces Paul to the apostles. And what would have happened if Barnabas hadn't been there? Because we all know people who've come to know Christ, and then after a period of time they've walked away from the church because they met toxic people, because they met ugliness, because they saw in the church things they didn't expect to see from the people of God. What would have happened if Barnabas hadn't been there to bridge that gap. Now, who did God use in your life? Who who are the people or the particular person who he used to introduce you to faith, to help you grow in faith? Who's made a difference in your life since then? That's part of your story. And then third, what has he been doing since then? What has God been doing in your life since you first came to know him? Uh, For Paul, three things happen when he gets saved, two of them immediately and one uh, a few years down the road. Number one, the persecutor became persecuted. The persecutor of Christ became persecuted by those who opposed the Christian movement. And it's ironic, there are some people who believe, some scholars and and skeptics who believe that, that Paul was a big phony, that he made up his conversion story because We're there at the beginning of the the Christian movement. He saw which way the winds were blowing. He saw this movement was gaining momentum. He said, I want to get in on the ground floor of this. If I'm going to be a leader, I have to make up a story in which I meet Jesus. Sort of like that evangelist I talked about earlier who made up his story of being a high priest in the church of Satan. And they say, that's what Paul did. And look how he profited. Oh, really? Paul didn't write any bestsellers. Paul didn't become rich and famous. In fact, when Paul converted to Christ... Everything he once held dear was gone. You can read about it in Philippians 3. Everything that once meant anything to Paul began to slip away the moment he said yes to Jesus. His esteem in the eyes of his countrymen, his own sense of self-righteousness, everything he thought was precious and necessary for, for success was gone forever. And he became pursued. In fact, that very, uh, that very city where he began to preach the gospel, they had to lower him in a basket from the city wall to keep him from being killed by his fellow Jews. And that would be the story of the rest of his life. They never stopped trying to kill him. And they finally succeeded in the end. Why would anybody make up a story that would lead to that kind of suffering? Paul became persecuted when he converted to Christ. But second, he started proving that Jesus was the Messiah. Verse 26 says, or verse 22 says he was confounding his fellow Jews, not because they were ignorant. They were very learned people, and yet he was outsmarting them. He was outreasoning them. Paul was, was a unique individual. He had, he had the training, uh, uh, the education that few could have had in those days because of his sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. He had an incredible inborn a natural intellectual capacity, and he had this incredible zeal to get things done. And when you combine those gifts with the Holy Spirit coming into him, all of a sudden this is the perfect man to change the world. The perfect man to explain to all of us for the rest of time the doctrines of salvation. And that's what he did in writing the New Testament and writing so many letters that became the New Testament. And then Third, he began to spread the gospel among the Gentiles. This didn't happen until several years later. We'll look at this next week. But think about it. What Paul did when he began to take the gospel from his home church in Antioch to places where the gospel had never been spoken, he was breaking new ground. Nobody had ever done anything like that before. But it changed our world forever. A couple of years ago, I sent off my DNA to one of these companies that analyzes, and they sent back word that um, I, was, I was a mixture of several European uh, uh, ethnicities and not one drop of Jewish blood. So if not for Paul, my people never would have heard the gospel. And 
you could probably say many of you the same thing. He changed the world because he chose to go where God sent him. That's what God did in Paul's life after he came in and changed him. Now, what about you? Now, of course, no one says that you and I have to change the world to the same extent that Paul did. I don't think that's in the cards for me. It may be for you, and if so, I'll cheer you on. But it doesn't matter. Your story is still important. You are still of equal importance to Paul in God's plan, believe it or not. And I don't know about you, but the most exciting things in my story are things that happened after my conversion, not before. The, the parts of the story I love telling are, are things that have happened since then. So what about you? What has God been doing in your life since He changed you? Maybe your story is, is about how God helped you overcome some tragedy. Maybe the death of a loved one. Maybe a crippling accident or a, or a terrible illness. Or maybe the end of a marriage or the breakup of a family. Maybe it's how God showed you your purpose and you said, yes, I'm a, a lawyer or I'm a roofer or I'm a, a landscaper or I'm a dentist or whatever the case may be, and that's what I'd get paid for. But my real purpose is I love teaching teenagers the Bible or I love uh, working with other people's little children and helping them come to know the come to know Christ as their Savior. I, I'm passionate about helping the homeless, or I'm, 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 I'm zealous about stopping human trafficking or fighting against legalized abortion or whatever the case may be. That's the story. That's what God has been doing in your life since then. Or maybe, maybe it's a story of some huge mistake you made somewhere along the road. You wandered from God. You made a bad choice. And God took what looked like destruction and He, he brought peace to the chaos. And you can say, here's, here's what I did wrong and here's how God weaved it into his plan and made something good come out of it. What is your story? See, I want to close by giving you a challenge and an encouragement. My challenge is twofold, and I really want you to do this. My challenge, number one, is write out your story. Some of you have done this, but most of you probably haven't. I want you to actually go through the discipline of writing it down, and I mean briefly, like two, three paragraphs at most. And, and as pastor, you have my permission to use this as your daily devotional time tomorrow, if you want. Or if you don't have a daily devotional time, I don't want to know. But schedule some time in the morning or the evening, whenever you're most fruitful mentally, and just take that outline. Here's how God changed my life. Here's who He used to do it. Here's what He's been doing in my life since then. Use that outline and write it out. Actually put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard or however you best write. And write it out. Second part of the challenge, send it to us. Especially that second part. We're really interested in learning who has God used to change your life. We're, we're emphasizing this idea of transforming relationships. That's what we want our church to be about. So if you'll, if you'll send me that paragraph and tell me it was, it was my football coach. It was my third grade teacher. It was the, the lady who taught Sunday school when I was a teenager. It was my boss when I first got out of college. It was my father-in-law when I first got married. If you'll tell us those stories, that would be of immense help to us. So send us, you can send me the whole story if you want, but especially that second part, because I want to be able to use those stories to encourage others and say, see, we as a church need to be people who produce those kinds of people. So email it to me, or take a video of yourself telling it and send it to us. But we want to know those stories. That's going to bless us. That's going to bless a lot of people. Now, here's your encouragement. You ready? Your story isn't over yet. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad you've messed up, no matter what age you are or what others have said about you, your story's not over yet. And the reason I know your story's not over yet is I look around the room, every one of you seems to be breathing. And when your story's done, you won't be. When your story's done, you'll find yourself in the presence of Almighty God for the first time. Until then, God is not done. And you may say to me, well, Jeff, the honest truth is I don't really, I can't really pinpoint a time when God changed my life. I don't know that that's ever actually happened. Well, your story's not over yet. And today can be the beginning of the good part of your story when you come and you say, I've been going to church, I've been believing these doctrines, I've been trying to be good, but now I need Jesus to change me. And come talk to me back there in the library across the atrium from here. And I'd love 
to help you take those next steps. And maybe you'd say to me, I I know that Jesus has changed my life. I just can't think of anything exciting that's happened since then. Well, your story's not over yet. And it could be that you'll look back and say, boy, I sure regret all those decades when I just sort of drifted spiritually, but it's not over yet. The best and most important things in your life can happen now, between now and the day you pass away or Christ comes back, whichever comes first. And you may say to me, yeah, Jeff, I've got a great story, but here lately it's sort of been on cruise control. Just understand, there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. You may stop doing what you got paid to do. You may stop doing what you used to do. But you're always, always of use to the kingdom of God. Your story's not over yet. So, so go to him and say, Lord, I want to be exactly who you created me to be. I don't want to miss a single opportunity Show me what I should be doing. Show me the relationship I should be involved in. Show me how to make a difference in someone's life today. You know, we've got one more week on our focused prayer campaign. If you're not involved in that, I hope you are. I hope you'll get involved for the next week and help us pray those four things we're praying together. But the truth is, your story's not over yet, and God has a plan to write something amazing into your life between now and when you stand before Him. And the only question is, are you going to allow him to be the author? Are you going to insist on holding the pen yourself? Let him write the story and just see what he can do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for your grace and your power, your mercy, and your love. Lord, I thank you for the story that you wrote in Paul's life and the way that that changed the world. And we're all benefiting from it. I pray, Lord, thank you for the story you're trying to write in my life and the times in my life when I can look back and and see the, the moments when I allowed you to be in control and how much good fruit came from it and continues to come. Lord, I pray for anyone here who is not yet a follower of you, has not yet received you as their Savior, anybody listening to me at home, Lord, I pray that they, today would be their day of salvation. Lord, for the rest of us, for anybody who has who's just missing out on the abundant life that you've created us to live, saved us to live, I pray that we would come back to you and let you be the author of our salvation, the author of our lives. Lord, use us to make a difference in the lives of others each and every day. Show us the transforming relationships you want us to be involved in. Lord, use First Baptist Church to bring peace to the chaos in our county and our, our world. And Lord, we pray for all the people stumbling in darkness in our community that you would bring them into your light. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Robert Robertson wrote a hymn years ago about how our hearts are so fickle. And we're prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. He won't let go of us. But isn't it a good idea to say, Lord, just renew me, bind my heart to you? Let's all stand and sing that song right now.
want to take a second to say thank you again for choosing to be here this morning. Those of you that were online with us, again, thank you for joining us by that way. Just want to challenge you with this. You know, as we heard Pastor Jeff open this sermon series looking at the life of Paul, we heard clearly today, and I think you've been hearing it all year long, uh, that you have a story to tell. And we've learned this morning that maybe it's not as impactful as Paul's might have been. We may think that. But know that God wants to use you uh, to share your story with someone this week. So share the transformation that God has done and worked in your life uh, with somebody that God has brought into your path over the course of the next week as we seek to achieve the vision that God has laid before this church, being a part of 10,000 transforming relationships all across this city, this county, and across our world. So thank you for again for being here, being a part of that. You know, it's one thing that we gather together to equip each other to do the work that God has called us to do. And one thing that we have that we can bring to him is the time, the talent, the treasure that God has entrusted to us as we prepare to close in prayer. I want to be praying that God would continue to use the financial resources of this church. I can share with you two things this morning. One, on September the 27th, the last Sunday of this month, we'll have a special called business meeting at the conclusion of each of our services that weekend to adopt uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, the bottom line number, $2.6 million, that's this year, is also the bottom line number for next year. We're leaving that budget flat. There'll be some changes uh, within that $2.6 million, one of which uh, prayerfully is that the debt payment will not be included. We're down to under $60,000 left and are confident that that is going to be paid off by the end of this month. So thank you, uh, church family, for your continued obedience. I saw a couple of hands start to clap. You can certainly clap for that update. And if you need reminders about this, I know that many of you know this, but you can continue to give online, fbcconroe.org slash give. Also, mail in your offerings, or as some of you do here in the room, bring that with you on Sunday mornings and drop that in those boxes in the atrium before you leave. Let's pray together, and then I want to share two other announcements with you before you go. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the story uh, that you have written on on so many hearts in this room and so many um, that are listening and watching online today, a story of transformation and life change through your son Jesus. And so help us uh, to, to share that story and continue as, Jesus, as Jeff said right at the end, to just hand you the pen and allow you to continue writing our story and not take control where you want to have that. We thank you so much for the continued obedience and faithfulness of, of giving here in this church and the way that we've been able to, to impact so many different lives and organizations uh, through missions and local giving and the way that you're reducing that debt payment each week. We thank you for that and pray that we would continue to be faithful there as individuals and as a church family. Now keep us safe, keep us healthy, uh, use us for your glory as we go from this place and go about the work that you've called us to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Two quick announcements. One, just want to share with you, as Jeff said at the beginning of his message, we are resuming life groups next Sunday morning, 945. A majority of our groups are choosing to meet then. There are a couple that are meeting at different times and in different locations, so be sure you pay attention to information that will come to you from your life group leader about where and when you'll be meeting. Uh, Also, if you're not in a life group and you're interested in being a part of one, uh, send me an email, alan at fbcconroe.org, so that I can begin to work with you on where to find a place to connect to a life group. And next uh, Saturday and Sunday in all three worship services, we'll have a kind of a, a recasting, a refocus on the vision that God has called us to as a church family. And we'll also be uh, sharing together in all three services as well in it, as in homes for those that are watching online, the Lord's Supper uh, in all three services next weekend as well. So you'll want to be sure and be a part of that. Take that story that God has written on your heart, write it down today, tomorrow, and begin to share that story with those around you. Y'all have a great day, and we'll see you next weekend.